Right. Uh, okay. So, uh, good evening. So, this is uh, Professor Ramat Sami talking, and uh, I will hopefully get you engaged in next hour and a half. And I hope you all are uh, safe, happy, and doing well in whatever you are doing. So, uh, the plan is uh, like this. I think I was told by the two very able uh, Ada Kappa new officers, both Natalie and Cody, that they usually serve pizza at Kappa new faculty talks. But of course, uh, it may not be as possible. So if you have your fax number, we can arrange that. So you see, this is a restaurant, Leonardo Pizza. They actually fax pizza. So if you give us your phone number, uh, let me see why it's not advancing here. Oh yeah, so the future is e pizza. Okay, so Cody, are you planning to fax them pizzas? I hope. <laughs> if, uh, or, if we can find a suitable. Are you guys now. hearing me? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so the plan is I give you a little bit overview about our group. And then I give you some overview about what the antenna is all about. Maybe some of you have done some work and some of you haven't done any work at all. And then uh, we'll go to a little bit more detail on the medical application. That's the plan. So let's see how we can progress. I have a bunch of uh, slides, so I do my best to adhere to the time, but I can always control it, all right? And the plan is towards the end. We leave a little bit of time for if there are any questions, discussions that we can entertain. Uh, for some reason, why is not advancing? My, oh yeah, here. All right, <laughs> so let me also do something here so I can get this uh, high video panel. Okay, that's better. So the title of the presentation, as you guys voted for, there were a bunch of them, but then you guys selected this one to be maybe more appropriate for all of you. It's called the Biotelemetry and Diagnostics, Creating an Exciting Paradigm in Modern Healthcare Systems. In particular, our angle from Maxwell's equation and antennas and how these pieces of the puzzle play a paramount role in this new technology and new development. So I'm Yayo Ramat Sami, I'm a professor at ECUCLA, and uh, my website is there, and so hopefully we can go through some of the details as we progress in this presentation. Uh, okay, maybe this, all right. So if you go to our website, most of the material you see in this presentation, you can find it on our website, either through papers or through books or book chapters. So our website is uh, www.antennalabee.ucla.edu. And you see this front uh, page is actually me uh, sitting in the lap of Einstein. And this is the statue of Einstein by the National Academy of Engineering, uh, which when I got to be elected as a member of National Academy, it was opportune time to take this photo. But the reason I'm showing you, because in our website, the starting website has this statement from Einstein. It says, if at first an idea does not sound absurd, then there is no hope for it. So uh, it is, uh, very profound statement, and that's what we do in our research group. We try to look at the absurd ideas and see if we can solve them effectively and interesting way. So always keep that in mind. If at first an idea does not sound absurd, then there is no hope for it. So you always go after difficult ideas. Uh, all right. Okay. So uh, I'll always go with my students to many international conferences. And we always get together even the uh, current students or former students. And this has been a habit for us to stay engaged. So I strongly believe it is immensely rewarding to work with talented students and see how they develop and grow in their professions. So we keep 
uh, in touch with many of them. Some of them are now professors someplace, some of them are still the students, some of them work at Jet Propulsion Lab, they're all over the world, and of course, many places in the US. Also, we try to socialize with our lab students, and we occasionally we go to lunch and we get together in the lab. So I found that very critically important to stay engaged with my students. So students are key players in keeping us, meaning the professors, inspired and motivated. So you guys play a critical role for us to stay engaged for sure. So now, what is the roadmap of the talk today? I've made it in three pieces. The left piece uh, is said introduction. So we go a little bit about Maxwell's equation, not much math at all, conceptual. Everything in this talk is conceptual. And I have entitled that Maxwell's equation are 150 years old and is still kicking. And you understand what I mean by that later. Then we talk about on the right, the medicine monitoring, some RFID systems, some again out of the box concepts. And then in the middle, the medical diagnostic and sensing here, we talk about a little bit brain machine interface, MRI and some other application. So right now I'm going to focus on the left part uh, on top. Okay. All right, so my group, we do diverse areas of research, which somehow relates to electromagnetics and antennas. So we work with the radio astronomy antenna, large dishes for space and ground. We work with remote sensing. These are the antennas, they look towards the earth in order to sense what the earth is doing, uh, detecting hurricane, detecting the wind on the surface of ocean and things like that. And then uh, we also do work um, in the personal communications. We have been one of the pioneers in this area in terms of development of the cell phone antennas, antennas for laptops, and you name it. But today, my focus will be more on the medical part of this application. And more recently also, we are engaged in some nanostructure development. However, the bottom line in all these activities relies on Maxwell's equations. So let's uh, revisit that a little bit from top level and then see how it relates to a lot of work that we do in my lab. All right, so what are the major math skills and fundamental concepts required in order to be able to solve the work that we do in my group? So if you know, electromagnetism consists of vector fields governed by Maxwell's equations. A very important statement. These are vector fields, but their behavior in nature is governed then EM waves travel with the speed of light. EM field consists of electric and magnetic vector fields. EM fields obey Maxwell's equations. And antennas radiate and receive EM waves. So that's the big uh, background in what we are going to talk about today. So the courses which are, uh, we have at UCLA which can relate to these topics are 101 A and B, which I assume some of our undergraduate students have taken them. 162 A, 163, 164, and a bunch of uh, graduate courses that they all somehow deal with Maxwell's equation, different aspects of it. Uh, okay. Now, there are three giants who revolutionize our understanding of the laws of nature. So I'm pretty sure many of you recognize the guy on top left and try to make a recording later on and tell me what you think. And you all also recognize the guy on the right bottom. So the one on the uh, top left is nobody but uh, Isaac Newton. And he was a key uh, scientist in 18th century, which put the amazing uh, marking in the history of science. Now, the guy on the bottom right is nobody but Albert Einstein. This is 20th century, and of course, he revolutionized our concept of space and time. What is uh, probably most interesting to us in my profession is this guy. Probably many of you don't recognize him because he's, unfortunately, he's not made as popular as the other two guys. However, his contribution to the science probably 
is as important, if not more important. And he is our good friend, James Maxwell. And he is the guy in 19th century. He is not as well appreciated as others. And one of the missions I have in my life to popularize him as much as possible. So I occasionally suggest to my students to make a portrait of him and put it on the front of their door of their dorms or bedroom or whatever. Whoever comes to their uh, place, they introduce Maxwell to them and gradually we get to know him well. So he contributed immensely. Everything around you is based on what he discovered. So we are going to focus more on this gentleman, Maxwell. So let's see uh, what, what is importance of that. So he discovered his equations in the original form 20 equations in 1864. It's almost 150 years ago, about 155 years ago or 156 years ago to be more exact. And it revolutionized everything, that discovery of Maxwell's equation. We just uh, give you a little bit of synopsis what happened if some of you have not uh, seen it in your courses. So the creator of electromagnetic EM theory is nobody but Maxwell. So he wrote it originally in 20 equation, scalar. But later on, people discovered vector calculus. So as you can see, vector calculus is not such an old topic as math. It's probably around 120 years old. And then Maxwell's equation were rewritten in the form of the vector calculus. So you can see there are a bunch of operation here. Curl of E, divergence of D. So D relates to E by epsilon. E and curl of H and divergence of B on the left hand side, and then time derivative of this quantity on the right hand side. And that is the key representation of Maxwell's equation that allowed us to understand what is going on. So, the way I portray that, I say tremendous amount of knowledge is hidden in these four equations. But now, what is the ingredient of this equation for some of you who enjoy math? These are four coupled partial differential equations. Why partial? Because the derivative are not a straight derivative because E, B, D, all of them are function of space and time, four variables. So therefore derivatives are partial and they are coupled because you see curl of E in the bottom, you see divergence of epsilon E or D and so forth and so on. So these four equations, they work together. They're not independent. As a matter of fact, if there is no time dependence, then would they become independent? Then that brings you to electrostatic and magnetostatic. Because of a time dependence and this coupling, it becomes Maxwell's equation. And profoundly amazing consequences uh, came after that. So these four equations forever change how we live, play, and enjoy life. And look around you. Everything is based on these uh, equations. You may ask why Maxwell's equation are four in this more modern form. And if you can go back to your vector calculus, there are fundamental theorem of vector calculus, which says the following. Given curl and divergence of a vector field F in volume V and boundary conditions on surface S, it can be proven that F is unique. That's very important. Why is that? Because in in the nature, we have electric and magnetic field. So if I know the divergence and curl of electric field, and if I know the divergence and curl of magnetic field, then I know those fields uniquely. And that's exactly what Maxwell's equation is all about, as you saw in the previous uh, slide. Curl of E, divergence of E, curl of H, divergence of H. So these together complete the story. So that's why mathematically also profoundly important to appreciate why there are four equations in this modern form. Now, there are some uh, amazing consequences came from Maxwell's equation. First, time varying currents radiate electromagnetic waves traveling with the speed of light. And that's uh, profoundly amazing. For example, I have an example here, your cell phone near your head, and then uh, let's say you send signal from your cell phone to the tower. So you see something amazing happens here. I want you to stress on that. And that's something that nature has done. Nature has done the most amazing thing. Namely, 
EM waves detach themselves from antenna. So let me pause and you think about it. So you have an antenna or piece of metal or whatever, and you have a current which oscillates with some frequency, and then all of a sudden these electromagnetic waves detach themselves. And once they detach themselves from the source, then they propagate throughout the universe. So that's why we see signal coming from uh, even as early time as Big Bang, because they also had the charges with oscillated in, in time, and they created the electromagnetic radiated field. So this detachment of EM waves from this piece of metal, which oscillates current, it's unbelievable that nature does that, but that's profoundly important. So as you can see in the bottom of this chart, EM waves were discovered through mathematical equation. So even 150 years ago, we didn't know EM waves exist. We knew about light, but we didn't know light was EM waves. So it just was discovered through man manipulating the equation. So I always tell my students, be very nice to your equation. There are a lot of hidden stories in your equation if you know how to handle that. Then of course, uh, other issues come in, namely the wavelength, because this is an oscillatory uh, uh, feature, and then uh, different frequencies. You have a gamma ray, light, microwave, and all that, and all this controlled by the rate of oscillation, by the period and the wavelength, so you all should be aware of that. Now, in the bottom of this chart, I have a very strong statement. It says, antennas are the most important man-made devices to deal with EM waves. So without antenna, you cannot transmit or receive electromagnetic waves effectively, and that's why they are such an important piece of the puzzle. So now, these four equations also predicted existence of EM waves. How fast do EM waves travel? So many of you, you used to live in Westwood, maybe not now, and not too far away from Beverly Hills. So you see cars like a Ferrari and all those good cars. So they might go 200 miles an hour if you don't get a ticket. If you go on the plane, again, you are not doing it recently, but whenever you did it, you might be flying about 600 miles an hour. And when you talk to your friends, uh, just acoustically through airwaves, so that's about 720 miles an hour. These are respectable speeds, but they are there. But just look, what is the speed of electromagnetic waves? 666 million miles an hour. Astonishing. It just, uh, and as we know from uh, uh, <clears throat> um, Einstein's theory, nothing can go faster. This is ultimate speed. But can you feel how fast this is? So therefore, it's so important that we rely on this speed to create our communications. It makes a lot of sense because everything is almost instant. So when I'm talking to you, all my talks and everything is digitized, sent to the antenna, go through the uh, electromagnetic waves, reaches to you almost instantly because our distances are so short compared to the speed of light or speed of electromagnetic waves. So we have to be very happy that we are dealing with the uh, uh, some important aspects of the nature, which is the fastest ever, so far that we believe. Now, how do you then uh, understand what the antenna is doing in the bigger picture? So I made this little slide for you to give it a fundamental understanding. So fact from physics, accelerated charges radiate. This is profoundly important statement. Whenever there is a charge, when that charge oscillates with respect to time, which has acceleration, then it radiates. So you all remember the simple equation I equal QV. Q is the charge and V is the velocity. Now, if the charge is now time varying, you mean the current. So derivative of current on the right is Q dV dt. Look here, dV dt is a derivative of velocity. So derivative of velocity is acceleration. Therefore, based on the previous statement, you immediately observe if your current changes with time, it must radiate. And that's the heart of the, the story of antennas. You try to design apparatus which supports the time varying current and hence it radiates. So observation, time varying currents produce electromagnetic radiation governed by Maxwell's equation. 
So once this E and H field propagate into space, they must satisfy Maxwell's equation. There's no other chance for them if they want to be electromagnetic waves, and indeed they do. So then how do I define antennas? There are electromagnetic devices controlling the flow of time-varying currents, thus producing EM radiation with desired characteristics. So it could be antenna on your laptop, it could be antenna on your spacecraft to do remote sensing, could be antenna on your cell phone, could be all kinds of other antennas for medical application. But the key is that we as a designers of antenna are able to manipulate the motion of the current on these uh, materials and hence control how the electromagnetic radiates. Okay, well, simplest example, your flashlight is an optical antenna. Remember, electromagnetic waves has a huge spectrum, goes from gamma ray to light to microwave to very low frequency. It's not DC, but it can go as low as almost DC. So flashlight is indeed, is an antenna. You can call, I have a, next time you see your friends, don't call it uh, flashlight. Say I have optical antenna and try to uh, uh, you know, uh, snow them with your understanding of, uh, of the optical antennas. What is that optical antenna in this case? Essentially, it's a little mirror, which is parabolic mirror. So you have a little light in the focal point of this parabola, and then this mirror, which is your, antenna, but optical antenna, uh, focuses the energy which is coming from that little light into the far distances because of the nature of this parabolic surface. So that's uh, uh, something that you all have uh, experienced with it. And uh, flashlight is optical antenna. So now uh, let's uh, see what are the typical antenna parameters. So you can have a one end, your circuits, like your source, your whatever that create the, uh, the oscillating current. And then you have the antenna which supports the current, which is now oscillates. But because of what we saw, the electromagnetic wave detaches itself. That's the most important profound uh, thing that nature has done. Once you have an oscillating current, it creates electromagnetic waves, it detaches itself from the source. Once it detaches itself from the source, it radiates into space. So the main role of a good antenna is to efficiently deliver the power from the source to the space, to space EM waves or vice versa. Vice versa means that in reverse, if electromagnetic wave comes to the antenna, the role of antenna is to efficiently capture that electromagnetic waves and deliver it to the load. So because of that, then you have a circuit parameters like radiation resistance, input impedance, all kinds of things. And you have a transition region, which is your antenna, how the current behaves on this, uh, whatever that device is, and what happens into space. So into space, we are interested, what is electric field? What is a magnetic field, which they obey Maxwell's equation? How the radiation pattern is formed, because energy is not radiated uniformly in all directions. What is the gain? One antenna is small, one antenna is big, has different characteristics. So from this chart, you can see, you can relate the quantities to the actual performance. All right, uh, I don't go through this detail, but if, again, some of you might be more circuit oriented. So this input uh, impedance match is very important. As I said, you can look at the terminal of antenna as a device, and that device has its own impedance. And then you have your source, which your source has also its own internal impedance. You all know from uh, your circuits, in order to deliver the maximum power to any load, it better be that the source um, impedance and device impedance to be conjugate match. Then you get the best deliverability. As a matter of fact, this is the heart of a RFID design. Uh, so as you know from circuit courses, the maximum power is delivered to any device when there's a conjugate match. So we always strive to see how to design antenna to be properly matched to the source in order to make that whole arena very efficient. 
So make, I always found in my life, probably, probably you too, sometimes you work with other people who may not be in your profession. So sometimes making an analogy is very effective way to communicate. That's very important. The analogy is very important. So I was a department chair at UCLA from 2000, 2005. And I was invited to give a talk at the Rotary Club Beverly Hills. And the audience, it was luncheon. I was a luncheon speaker. And then the audience were bankers, some uh, movie people, you name it, all Beverly Hills type crowd. And they wanted me to talk about what I do. I don't know why they invited me, but it was fun. So the night before, several years back, I said to myself, how can I excite that community to appreciate what I'm doing? So you see, I've written here, if you are at a party and somebody asks you, who are the antenna EM scientists and engineers? What would you say to impress the person? Not only impress them, but also get them engaged to listen to you. So the night before I came with some ideas. I said like Van Gogh, who used his brushes to create paintings. Electromagnetic scientists are artists who are able to paint the radiation of electromagnetic waves with their antennas. You see the analogy? Van Gogh uses his brush and he paints. We as the electromagnetic scientists, we use our antenna to uh, control the radiation of electromagnetic waves. So that's kind of a painting. All of a sudden they felt very comfortable. Wow, now this guy is also maybe an artist, so let's listen to him. So then I challenged them, I told them, look at the Van Gogh's paintings here, and look at some of my paintings, which all came on the cover page of many journals. And now I ask you the question, as you're listening to me, I think my paintings are more beautiful. What do you think? So maybe Cody can get the response from you guys, and let me know if you think my paintings are more beautiful. I hope that's what you do, all right? Okay, let's keep on going. So how you design these antennas? Things have gone very advanced because now we understand that electromagnetic waves must obey Maxwell's equation. So therefore, if I want to design an antenna to have radiation in some particular formation, I have to rely on Maxwell's equation. So we in my group have developed a lot of uh, uh, numerical uh, uh, capabilities to, to uh, design, synthesize, and optimize antennas by doing all kind of electromagnetic codes development and also linking them to some elaborate uh, optimization techniques like particle swarm optimization, genetic algorithm, which are nature-based optimization. And additionally, there also exist many powerful commercial Maxwell's equation solvers helping designing sophisticated antennas. So nowadays, you can do all kinds of fancy things because of the power of the uh, computers, power processing. So some of these designs might take a week on the computer because you have to do this detailed mathematical solution of Maxwell's equation, but it's doable and you can get all kinds of interesting stories out of them. Let me give you an example because it relates to what we are talking today. So what this example shows, I'm talking about implanted antennas for biomedical application. And this particular design works in the frequency band of 402, 405. This is a band which is allocated for this kind of work. So how do I design this antenna? My goal is in the middle, optimize miniaturized implanted antenna that can be put inside the body. So what we do, if you can see on the right, we model the human being, we call it EM, by its EM tissues, so EM model of the human. In detail, I'll show you some uh, things later on. We characterize them in terms of the permittivity, conductivity, you name it. So bones is different than, uh, than uh, flesh, and flesh is different than brain. Brain is different than your heart, and all that, they all have their own electromagnetic properties. But nowadays, we are able to model it in very detail. Then we pixelize that model, <clears throat> as uh, depicted here, of course, it can be the whole entire body, I'm just showing the torso. And then we use our uh, uh, Maxwell uh, solvers to design some 
creative antennas, which has to work properly inside the body. That's the key. And remember, one of the key points of antenna to work efficiently, it must uh, have a good match, but not uh, match in the free space, match in the body. So we designed that it works effectively when it's positioned inside the body. We also give attention to parameters called specific absorption rate, which is a measure of safety. Because if that antenna uh, radiates from inside the body to outside, it could heat up the tissues around it. And you cannot let the tissue get too hot because then it's dangerous and could create some uh, problems. So there are standards that restricts how much power or power level can be uh, excited around the antenna in the body. So we are also able to calculate those. And then ultimately, where my pointer is, we look at the radiation pattern. You kind of probably can't see it too well for some reason. It came a little bit faint. But what that means that if this antenna is inside the body, as you can see, it radiates most of its energy towards the front of the body, very little in the back. And that's where you try to communicate with this device if you have to. So you can see all the things I've told you is here. This guy here supports a time varying current. What is the frequency of time varying current? 400 megahertz. And since it's time varying current, it radiates, but it radiates inside the body getting out. Some of the energy gets absorbed, as you can see here. Some of the get, get energy gets out, and that's the way you create your communication link between inside and outside. And we talk about this a little bit later. Now, we have uh, written a lot of papers, we, of course, with the collaboration of my very able students, and these are just representative. And we were fortunate, many of them came on the cover page of all kinds of scientific journals. So these are all on my website. You are most welcome to go and look at them. And you know, we, we work on the cell phone antennas, as you saw here, we were some pioneers. We talk about antennas going on Mars. We talk about the CubeSat antennas. We talk about antenna designs for remote sensing, and you name it. It's all over all kinds of things that we do in my group. We also have some books. If you are interested, you can go to our website and see what they are. For example, this particular one is a very fascinating book about electromagnetic optimization by genetic algorithm. We use the concept of the nature-inspired uh, concepts and apply it to optimization of antennas and so forth. And this one is implanted antennas in medical wireless communications, for example. And we also have many book chapters all over, 35 of them. And again, they all deal with different things. Uh, for example, you have a chapter in this book called Electromagnetics of Body Area Networks, and you name it. This book is all the mathematical and numerical techniques to solve Maxwell's equations and so forth and so on. Now, antennas can be extremely large. We have work on some of them. This is Effelsberg 100 meter antenna in Germany for radio astronomy. This is a Greenback 110 meter uh, Gregorian design. So we have a parabolic main reflector, hyperbolic or uh, elliptical sub-reflector. And these are very high resolution in order to take, to get the signals from far distance object. And this is the largest uh, hole in the ground, a receiver 300 meter, which now is put mesh to create antenna. So you can see antenna can become very large. Or they can be, used for satellite communication. These are all kinds of antennas. So we have work on all of them. Some of the, our designs are actually used in some of these applications. And one of the areas that I'm very interested in, antennas play critical roles in understanding our universe. So here, this is the most recent depiction what has happened from the beginning of Big Bang, or even a little bit before Big Bang, to today. And that's about 13.7 billion years. So I work on an antenna, it's called WMAP, which actually was one of the most sophisticated instruments, which was for NASA and uh, with Princeton University, which detected early radiation from Big Bang, very close to the early time, and it was probably one of the most accurate 
estimate of the how uh, old the universe is 13.7 billion years and there are other ones these are for remote sensing and so forth and so on so i'm really very excited to say i've been involved in originating many of these concepts so i'm glad to see they are useful now also most recently we have antenna aboard the uh, uh, space station this is actual space station and our antenna design sits on the space station and the goal is that to look towards the ocean and try to estimate the wind velocity of the ocean and these are very critical in accurately predicting the weather and things like that this was launched in uh, September 22nd 2014 aboard SpaceX and has been very successful and is still dancing in a space on uh, uh, space station it's called the rapid scan all right so it should be 6 30 so maybe i'm a little bit behind the time i see 6 35 so i probably pause a little bit make sure everybody is in the game uh so cody how are we doing so far so good yeah so far so good all right very good all right so now let's uh, move to another piece of the puzzle now we are going on the right. We want to talk about, now we understood what antennas are. They carry time varying current, they radiate, they can be used for all kinds of application. Now let's focus on more exciting medical related application and see what's happening there. So today we focus on representative novel antennas for medical applications. So you see examples for uh, a brain machine interface for capsule endoscopy, and some MRI application. Again, uh, this is the chart I'm showing you. The reason I'm showing you, because you all know that the name of our school is the Samueli School of Engineering, uh, right? So let's see what happened. As a matter of fact, uh, this cover, this particular paper that we wrote uh, uh, in 1995, this cover page article was based on a DARPA project that Samueli, Abidi, Padi, and myself collaborated in early 90s. This by far was one of the most successful collaboration in our department. And outcome of this project was so many things, including the, the dawn of a, the development of a Broadcom. So, but this is a, where we collaborated on a collaborative project for DARPA at our department, I was most successful, all right? Everybody played different roles, like Samueli was more on the chip part, and Abidi was more on the circuits and other aspects, Party was on communication, and my team was more on the antenna design. So it was a comprehensive collective design. I think the whole project was maybe about four or five years, an amazing number of papers came out, a lot of success. So in my group, when we got excited about this class of work, we evolved. So we started from handheld, and our work came on the cover page of the uh, IEEE Proceedings, one of the most reputable journal ever, 1995. Then we got into wearables, antennas that can be integrated with clothing and all that. Then we got into implanted, antennas that can be implanted inside the body for some application. Then uh, ingestible, the capsules with antenna that you can digest and it maps your internal organ. To, and then more recently, brain and MRI. So I give you a little bit of a flavor of some of these works. So when we did this work, we called it back mounted when we introduced the concept early 90s. Unfortunately, just to let you guys know, UCLA didn't get uh, excited to patent this. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure now they kick themselves that they did it. Because most uh, people now call them internal antennas, but we call them back mounted because it was positioned in the back of the antenna in order to make it more, um, uh, less uh, sticking out and also have some other features. So this was, in the 90s we did this work and uh, so we we're very proud of that and we were also some first group to understand interaction of antennas 
and the head and the brain, how much energy gets deposited at what frequency, at what distance and all that. So we wrote all kinds of things about this work uh, that uh, we initiated that. And then uh, because of our capability as time progressed, we made a lot more uh, exciting designs. These are the multiband. They can operate at multibands. And how did we design that? If you look at this, these look very peculiar looking beasts. Why this antenna looks like this? And the reason is that because we use our optimization methods. And through optimization, then we got designs which are not intuitive at all, but they function as we want them to be. So these are some really uh, amazing work that has got a lot of attention. We have extensive experience in designing and optimizing novel antennas. For example, if you look at this, and you will see this little B here, this B uh, represent the concept of the particle storm optimization, that we use the notion of the how the storms move around to find the most fertile area, and we use that concept to develop the optimization method, which now we can apply to the design of antennas. Just to give you a little bit of a appreciation, we start with the patch, look at this whole patch without any holes or anything. And we subdivide that patch to small pixels. And then we let optimization decide which pixel should be metal and which pixel should not. And when optimization finishes, we get the design which gives you the performance you want. So for that reason, the feature of this antenna is not intuitive whatsoever, but it's very functional concept. Or we have looked at some designs, again, came on some cover page of the uh, some magazines to design antennas to be positioned on the laptop. Look here, it's very interesting. If you see your laptop that you're looking at, of course you are communicating with this laptop. There are antennas here and there on this. But when you sit in front of it, you also absorb some of that energy. So you can see, depending where your laptop is positioned, some part of your body can get more uh, influenced by the radiation, somebody less. And indeed, when you look at the behavior of radiated field, depending if the uh, laptop is by itself in the free space or you sit in front of that, it would affect how this uh, radiation will happen. And that's very important when you create communication link. So let me uh, give you advice here. Next time you use your cell phone, or laptop, consider yourself as an antenna because now you're part of the antenna. Why? Because when the antenna on the cell phone or on your laptop radiate, it excites your uh, uh, electrons or whatever. Now electron in your body oscillates. And now we learn whenever the charges oscillate, they radiate. So therefore now you also radiate. So depending, how much power you absorb, how much the electron in your body oscillates, your radiation can be strong or weak or whatever. But we understand all these things uh, due to capabilities that we have developed. So pretty exciting story. So now lessons from past. Again, you guys are all uh, very smart students and I'm pretty sure you have a lot of dreams for your future and all that. Let's uh, review some interesting lessons from past and recent history. At least that has been my evaluation of when I look at the history of science and engineering. History has shown that it typically takes about quarter of century, 25 years, to bring any out of the box idea into mainstream. So if you look at from Maxwell's equation through Hertz, who was the first one who actually showed antenna radius to Marconi, to make it a viable communication. It's about 20, 25 years. The same is true if you look at the history of transistors. The same is true if you look at the history of any new ideas uh, the, from inception to where it comes to become into the mainstream and utilization by public, about 25 years. So now let's look at what I have written here. About quarter of a century ago, the research community was advertising the concept of global connectivity with anyone at any time 
in any place and with any amount of data. This is not a reality. So I was in the dawn of this, this revolution. As a matter of fact, I gave a lot of short courses almost 20 some years ago. And in those short courses, I was able to advocate this notion of the anytime, any place with any amount of data. That's a reality. Now let's see what's happening now. We are now in the midst of a new paradigm to becoming a reality. The next big paradigm is biotelemetry connecting patients to their doctors and hospitals at any time, any location, and with any amount of monitoring and diagnostics data. This is going to happen. It almost is happening. But as I said, it takes 25 years. This uh, second revolution happened almost maybe 10, 12 years ago. So it's still, it's not mainstream. It needs another 10 years, give and take, to make it mainstream. So always remember that. Be very patient. If you have something really unique and you say, wow, this is out of the box. I want to bring it. By the time it comes to the uh, public application, it takes almost a quarter of a century. Now it is maybe a little bit faster, but not too much faster. Okay, so, uh, so uh, this is a Niels Bohr. Probably many of you took physics courses. You've heard about Niels Bohr. So as a matter of fact, his uh, uh, photo was on a stamp in uh, Denmark. But he said something very profound. Prediction is very difficult, especially if it is about the future. So who could sense that uh, nowadays we have our cell phone, everything is uh, in our palm. We call Siri, we call Google, we ask every question we want to have, and somehow the answer, sometimes wrong, but majority right. But who could have even predicted this? So predicting the future is not easy. So American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering identifies the following major trends in the next 20 years. This is the story of three, four years ago. First, engineering a safe and sustainable water and food supply. They think that's important. How to engineering safe? Because water and food is most critical in the globe. And right now we have over, I don't know, 7 billion people. And the forecast is by 2050 maybe became, I don't know, 9 or 10 billion. So they have to eat, they have to drink. So engineering safe and sustainable water is important. Second, engineering personalized health care. And that's where this important revolution is. And that's where I'm engaged in and many other people. And a bunch of the other ones, but I'm going to focus on number two. And there are, of course, the frequencies which are allocated by FCC. I don't go through all of them. It could be 400 megahertz, 2 gigahertz, very popular frequency, 5 gigahertz, and a bunch of other ones. So there are a lot of different assignments, even in the millimeter waves. So uh, we work in uh, all kinds of frequencies, of course. And then uh, this uh, cover page came from Proceedings of IEEE several years back, 2012. And if you look at this, they show all these people, supposedly, they have antennas on their head. And the whole issue was antennas in wireless communication. We had a bunch of papers here. This cover page meant to suggest our growing dependence on wireless communication and the important role that antenna technology plays in keeping us connected. So that's where we are now. Biotelemetry managing care through air. So I'm just having a cartoon here. So you have your device inside your body. Your device might be communicated with your cell phone or directly to the tower. The tower might then uh, interact with the big antenna. They, we call it ground antennas, which then can communicate with satellites. And then you get connected to the hospital, whatever it is. So ultimately, this is a biotelemetry through uh, electromagnetic waves through Maxwell's equation, now we try to deal with the healthcare and bringing information rapidly, effectively, and hopefully securely. That's somebody else's story. I don't deal with the security part, but with the technology part. All right, so what is the big picture? Biotelemetry connecting patients to their doctors and hospitals at any time, 
at any location with any amount of monitoring and diagnostics data. So it needs an infrastructure. It needs some capability probably didn't exist last uh, 10 years ago, but now we are trying to bring them to conceptualization and development. We need convergence of experts from medical, biological, and engineering disciplines. As a matter of fact, my group, we do interact with some of the doctors at UCLA and some of the bioengineers in order to actually uh, understand this paradigm because we alone cannot do everything. We can bring the technology, but we need other people to take it to the next level in terms of the healthcare. Uh, excuse so, uh, yes, please. We have a quick question from the chat. Um, so the question says, wouldn't medical devices at a frequency of 2.45 gigahertz cause problems or interfere with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and other devices already set at that frequency? Uh, we, we, these are all very good questions. So even if you look at this 2.45, for example, uh, these are very uh, narrow band. So the, the particular band that the, they usually occupy may not be critically interfering. That's one story. Another very important story which this question relates to, that the power level which they allow you to radiate from your body are very low level. So for example, at hospitals, it's very critical that these devices do not interfere with other devices in the hospital. So the power uh, designation is also very critical in order to prevent interference. But for sure, interference always is a problem, not only for medical people, for example, if you work with a frequency like 1.4 gigahertz, a lot of people in radio astronomy hate it because many signals comes from universe are in that L band, about 1.2, 1 1.4. So interference is always an issue. For example, that's the reason some of these big antennas, they put it inside the mountain area in order to protect them from interference from cell phone and so forth. And unfortunately, because of the towers, because of the cell phone, it's getting more and more difficult. But then they have to somehow come together and agree that uh, how much power they can radiate in some bands. For example, nowadays, you know, people talk about ultra wide band system, which typically might go from three gigahertz to 11 gigahertz. And then essentially it covers a lot of frequencies, which is of interest to a lot of people. But in order to be able to do that, they are from FCC, they have regulation that the power level cannot go above certain level, hopefully diminishes the interference. Good questions. And again, I'll try to finish in reasonable time and then uh, we can answer even more questions. Make sure you write down your questions and then we revisit all of them, sure. All right, so now, I told you, uh, in order to do this electromagnetically, we are very now capable of modeling the entire human body on the computer. And that modeling is getting so sophisticated that we actually can directly work with these models and predict things very accurately. For example, this uh, slide represents uh, the human body, which is actually, sorry to say that, but it was a cadaver. So it was a slice every millimeter, transversely, every millimeter. And then the organs were read and identified and measured in order to assign what we call the permittivity and conductivity. So any piece of your body has different permittivity and different conductivity. For example, as you can see in this chart, it can go from almost no permittivity, which of course is uh, empty, and to 70, if you had a lot of water in part of your body, which body has a lot of water, you can go as high as 70. And the same with conductivity. And there are different models, but typically this is an average human height, 1.9 meter. But you know, there are a smaller one, bigger one, fatter one, all kinds. And the details of the brain is also very important, very detailed. So we have very sophisticated model is now available. Why do we need that? Because if you look at the Maxwell's equation, as you recall, it was a curl of uh, E and then a divergence of D. So D was epsilon E. So epsilon represents the permittivity properties of each of these pixels in the body. So 
when we solve the problem's entirety, we actually put the actual human body model. More sophisticated ones now you can, are more dynamic. You can have a blood flow in your model if you want to be important. Why this is important? Several reasons. One is that in order for your antenna functions effectively and efficiently, it has to function well in where, in what part of body is positioned. And secondly, if that device inside the body is not passive only receiving, but also radiates, then we have to worry about how the tissue gets warmed up around the body. And that's the big decision, especially near the brain. That's why we have this issue of a specific absorption rate that it controls the, how much heat can be created near the antenna or device inside the body in order to be safe. So there are regulations. Uh, if we have time, we can refer to some numbers. And, and already you have this, seen this chart. So that shows that our capability allows you to model the human, do numerical design, antenna design, look at how well the impedance is met. For example, if you see my cursor is around 403 megahertz and the match is better than minus 20 dB, which is great. What does this match mean? Let's say you have a device, you send the power A to the device. If the device is not matched to the source, most of that energy that you send might reflect back. So we want to reduce the amount of energy reflects back. You really want to deliver that power that you are spending money for it to the antenna, which then antenna efficiently radiates. That's the key. So when you say it's a minus 20 dB, it means that most of the energy gets to the antenna and radiates. Very little uh, reflects back to the source, which is great. So you always want to do that. And then you look at the, how this antenna is radiating around the body and then a specific absorption rate, what is the safety level and so forth and so on. All right, so our work has been noticed by many journals and so forth. This is one of my former students who is now in Korea. And this is the antenna we designed, which was at those days, this is a 2004, was pioneering. Many other designs followed on this path. So the goal was to miniaturize. We even have done more miniaturization these days and use the material which are okay inside the body. So there are uh, body uh, kind of protective layers on it, which doesn't affect the, badly with the human tissues and a bunch of other things. And another areas of interest is wearable. These are the antennas which are really uh, is very exotic and probably you have seen it now Nike many other institutions trying to do things like that that you integrate your devices with your shoes with your clothing and all that but you need different class of uh, antennas to be able to do that or it could be used in kindergarten hospitals you name it firefighters sports and so forth so these are the uh, collaboration with some people in, in my lab and also a lab in Finland, which we actually, these are stitches. We actually use embroidery machines to pattern these antennas. And uh, we actually have done work with our colleague in Finland. They have developed them, they put it in the washing machine, many, many cycles, make sure they're durable and they function right. Now uh, you see this could be in the RFID tag, which there is a chip there. So you send a signal, it, uh, it ignites the chip, and then uh, you read whatever the tag wants to tell you what this is all about, and then they radiate back. So this conjugate match of this design is very critical. And here, for example, we are using conductive thread with polymed uh, uh, core plated with silver, because you need conductivity, remember, the ultimate goal is you have to sustain uh, accelerated charges. Accelerated charges are the heart of electromagnetics radiation. All right? All right, so now you can see all kinds of fancy designs and now people are looking to be implanted or uh, on, the, on the clothing and so forth and so on. And uh, I'm on this chart, which is a title, a futuristic looking observation. 
And some people have already conjectured these things and things, things are happening more and more. We are just beginning to see RF technology permeate into other application of implantable electronic, such as uh, neuro, neuro stimulators and internal monitoring devices. There is work to be done and the most exciting diagnostic information is still in front of us, untapped waiting to be liberated and in need of the emerging RF technology for implantable devices. So some of the work that we did in our group was really considered reasonably pioneering when it happened. And now the whole uh, concept is evolving just beyond a lot of our expectations. So uh, I'm going to talk about another thing uh, in, in lieu of this. This is a capsule endoscopy. So there are 100 million individuals around the world are suffering from gast gastrointestinal tract bleeding. There is a critical need for solution that will significantly reduce delaying in timely diagnosis, patient discomfort, recovery time, and so forth. Existing pill capsules provide telemetry of uh, imagery and pH. But now we, we got into this, we wanna make these devices even better. And that's why I'm giving you a little bit of an uh, overview of what's going on. So it is uh, depicted in this slide. Propose a biomaker based on GI tract diagnostics with novel integrated sensing capsules. So the goal is that we want to have a very sophisticated capsule which has sensors. And then these capsules either externally get power or they carry their own power, like small battery. But they need very sophisticated antenna in order to be able, when they tumble, let's say, inside somebody's stomach and so forth, they still be able to radiate out and be captured by external devices. So there's a radial link that's critical for operation on this, this device. So integrated capsule with multi-biomaker sensing capability. Receiver is dedicated or cell phone based. And then we create this radio link. So uniqueness of proposed approach that we had in mind. No existing capsule can perform biomarker detection. So this is how we work with Professor Chian. Uh, who now no longer is at UCLA, but he was more the guy with the sensors, biomakers. We're talking about miniaturized capsule antenna design for drastically improved communications. We like to complete system integration for, uh, for uh, actually for clinical evaluation. We are not there yet because he left, but still we are excited to pursue this. So that's where it is. So it's a very sophisticated bio uh, marker here. His design that they can sense maybe some juices in the stomach. It was, uh, relates to ulcer or some other things. And then uh, we have a kind of a coil concept. If we do um, wireless power transfer, if we don't want to have a battery. And then we have our sophisticated optimized antenna, which Depend, no matter how, remember, electromagnetics are vector field. So if your receiver and transmitter antenna are mismatched, let's say one is horizontally oriented, one is vertically, you don't get any signal. But we don't know where this capsule is. So we have to design antenna which has a diverse polarization properties. No matter what the receiver antenna is, we can get some signals. So these are all very critical components to be appreciated. Okay, so that takes care of that part. And uh, so we have done a lot of work, so I don't wanna go through all of them. So this is a endoscopy as typically is done with, you know, they send cable through your throat and all that. And this is more modern. There do exist some uh, techniques. They use this uh, capsule endoscopy, but we wanted to improve the whole uh, capabilities. So, our goal was a physical size constraint. We want to have a capsule has many electric components, which may affect the antenna performance. 
if there are batteries, if there are battery less differently. And this is the frequency which for time being being considered, 13, uh, 1.3 megahertz to 1.4, very narrow bandwidth. So the data rate doesn't have to be huge, but good enough to tell you I'm sensing something or I'm not sensing something due to the uh, biomarkers that are inside the capsule to sense. So here uh, it shows some of the work. So uh, just give you an idea if you, let me go back and do it again. So if you look at this capsule, go through the mouth and then uh, it ultimately goes through the body. So we evolved the, from simple dipole antenna to more sophisticated antenna. And we have written papers on these things in order to give you a, a polarization capability, miniaturization and all that. And uh, it was uh, developed and then we did a complete numerical, again, this is a human body model. Now we are more interested in intestine area. So we detail that and then see how this antenna functions inside that body. And uh, so here are some results, radiation pattern, how this antenna radius, so communication links more in the front of the body, not from the back. But you know, you still get some signal in the back because everybody, everything radiates, but the front is more exciting for this application. All right, uh, very good. So then uh, for some of you are interested in communication link, of course you have to build up your communication link between the external device and internal device and identify what kind of bit rate you have and all that. Is it a really functionally achievable? And that's where the characteristic of these antennas are critical in order to create this uh, communication link. This is signal to noise, and these are the gain of these antennas and so forth and so on. All right, uh, okay, uh, let's see. Let me, and then uh, some uh, developments that are looking at the photolithography to make these antennas more uh, miniaturized and more flexible, be able to position it on the capsule and things like that. So these are still some ongoing work here and there in our group. Okay, very good. So uh, I'm switching, since I'm covering a bunch of things, just to give you guys ideas, what are the uh, exciting areas, uh, at least in the medical domain? So this was a medical diagnostics you saw. We're also looking at some interesting ideas we had. I think we were the first one who did it. I don't know how ultimately it would be applied or not, but conceptually it was exciting. Remember, I always told you guys, if at first an idea does not sound absurd, then there is no hope for it. This kind of absurd ideas. So let me tell you what is it all about. So you know, uh, Patients, identification, monitoring, and uh, you know, this, this part I'm interested. So uh, medicine, a lot of old people, uh, we don't know how well they take their medicine. So they usually give like this, medicine timers, uh, reminders to take your medicine, RFID tag in the con container. So this is available. So when they, people get reminded, take your pill and what time you took it and all that. But there's no guarantee that those, especially elderly, they hide their pills under their pillow. Nobody knows if they have taken it or not. So our uh, story is different. We were, so we don't know if they took it or not. You, you saw what happened here, right? Because, uh, it, so now the one that we are looking at, we want to make sure when you take it, there is a signal comes. So we know you took it. The tag on that uh, little pill activates only when it's uh, swallowed by the patient and sends a signal. So this was pretty exciting work. I don't go through details, just give you an idea. So we were hoping to have a reader here, circular polarized. So assuming at this minimum, we have to assume the patient puts that on their neck and if they are sophisticated people you can have gucci design or somebody else's design to make it good looking necklace so that is your receiver and then when the pill is taken only when it's taken the way the design has been made these guys communicate 
and then you know that particular pill is taken. Because that pill is, is, has some kind of a um, registration on it, so we know which pill was taken. You might take other pills or she, and that get registered differently. So that's a pretty exciting area. And so we have uh, designed uh, such a capsules with very sophisticated antenna load. So don't worry about the details. Again, we optimize these things and so forth. And it's designed to get conjugate match to the chip. So this is a chip location, which is conjugate match in order to have the best performance out of this design. So, so we have designed such a thing and uh, we have done some characterizations and all that and overall looks to be interesting. Now, how easy and uh, expensive it is to put such a thing on every pill yet to be understood, but you know, technology is evolving, I'm pretty sure is something feasible. All right? All right, so uh, again, we look at the specific absorption rate, how much power is radiated away from the neck to the receiver or vice versa to make sure everything is safe. And this particular work was done at 915 megahertz. These are some, some of the allocated bands for these kind of applications. Or Kidoki. So yeah, so seven. So now I'm 10 minutes behind. So I'll try to make the next part very quick. My goal was to finish by 7.20 and allow you guys if you have some questions. But if some of you already had your uh, uh, pizza faxed to you and you're not hungry and you wanna stay after 7.30, we can do that too. But let's plan to finish by 7.30, then we we'll let Cody and Natalie uh, make some uh, decisions on that, all right? All right, so the next uh, item of interest, first of all, I assume still you are there. I don't see you guys. I probably should be able to see how many people are. Oops, what did I do? Uh, uh, I don't know how many people are there or not, but that's okay. We can There's go about back. 20. Uh, okay, about 20. Okay, that's a good size. Okay, very good. So let's go back. So here it, my cartoon says, sorry, you have a temporarily lost your audience. but. I saw some of you, so I haven't yet. <laughs> okay, that's the good news. Please stand by. All right, so the next part of the puzzle is this lower portion. So this is a brain machine interface and then uh, MRI. I go quickly and uh, again, we have written on this thing, publication, books. If you are interested, you can go and find it on our website. I don't think your slides are displaying right now. Oh, it's not displaying? No. What happened? Uh, maybe my, my screen is not shared? Yeah, it's not sharing. Uh, is it shared now? No. Oh, share. Oh, let's, let me do that again. How about now? Yeah. Oh, you see it now? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That's good. Uh, okay, very good. No, do you see it now? Yeah, we see it now. Oh, okay, great. So we are going to say a few words about this part, maybe in the next five, six minutes, and then see what we can do. So the focus will be on two topics. One is a brain machine interface, and one is a, some MRI coil. So the big picture, brain machine interface. The advances in neuroscience during the past decade have brought the promise of a restoration of mobility, senses, and communication to patients suffering from uh, paralysis and uh, neurological diseases. This is achieved with devices transforming thought into action, thought into action, the brain machine interface, BMI systems. All right. So uh, there are a lot of uh, interesting story on this thing. So our contribution to this work with one of my PhD students, who she's going to uh, do her defense this quarter actually, was on this topic, uh, how to design antennas that can communicate with the electrodes the position inside the brain in order to detect uh, some interesting neurological features of the brain. So that's the, how it's depicted here. 
So you see, uh, uh, this is the neural recording and brain uh, stimulation. And then RF uh, ID uh, inspired wireless power data telemetry. And our goal was uh, to design the antenna system, at least one of the concepts. Other people are doing it in other institutions, of course. And these are the uh, neuro sensors, bunch of them. And then the signal from there gets captured to the antenna and then transfers to the external antenna and ultimately communicate with your computer or whatever. So anyway, so this antenna also was pretty exciting one. This is kind of a, because you have to make it easy for the patient. Some of the earlier ones, they were just too rigid and uncomfortable. So these are flexible embroidered antennas, which they can be positioned here. So you have to design these coils uh, carefully and effectively. And then this is a segment of the brain that we are interested. And this is air, this is a, let's say, receiving or transmitting antenna. Then you have a skin, you have fat, you have bone, you have brain. And uh, that uh, uh, electrodes are positioned in the brain part in order to detect the neuro signals and our antenna resides here. So again, this communication link is critical in order to understand the functionality. If you read the bottom line, an external electric field generates currents in the dielectric human body. Hence, power transfer via magnetic field in an inductive near field link is a favorable approach to the wireless powering of implanted devices. So this, this uh, class of antenna works more in the magnetic mode rather than electric mode. Typically, that's the case when you have a, a uh, loops or coils and things like that. So not going through the details, so a lot of work has been done in terms of miniaturization, power handling, and so forth and so on. And this is a, one of the uh, very uh, good designs. It's very small antenna, as you can see, one millimeter by one millimeter by one millimeter that resides inside. And this is the other antenna. So these are all really small. Uh, in order to be able to detect uh, characteristics of what we are looking at. So in, this is an implanted uh, loop antenna, and this is a transmitting loop outside, and so forth and so on. So this is about one millimeter cube, 3D cubical loop, very special loop, and uh, is conjugate match with the implemented IC. Again, conjugate match is important in order to make this uh, relation between the device and antenna uh, efficient, as I mentioned in the beginning. All right, so let's go down. And then we did a lot of work just to see how this link can be characterized. Again, a lot of numerical modeling, a lot of Maxwell equation solvers to deal with this, knowledge of the true human body as best as we can, and some simpler model on the left to see how reasonably good our sophisticated models are compared. We always do that check. You have a simple model that's easy to understand, and then we use these complex numerical models to compare with simple model and ultimately extend it to real story. As you can see, these are some parameters I was telling you. For the brain, the relative permittivity is about 50 and relative conduct and conductivity is a 0.5. So brain is not super conductive, but it's still pretty conductive. And then other tissues like skull is about 17.8, skin 46.7 and different conductivity. So all these are very important in modeling that tissue and understand what this antenna is doing. All right, so let's see. Yeah, maybe another three minutes, I stop. Now, in the last part, I have some interesting story. I have a good news and I have a bad news. So let's see what is the uh, good news. So the good news is this is not the topic of this talk. So the bad news part it is, but not the good news. So the good news is that UCLA is the number one public school in the US, that's pretty good news. Another good news, UCLA has 117, but maybe 118 NCAA championships for some of you who are a sports fan. So we used to be number one, but we are almost number one, number two 
with Stanford. So we have no, most number of NCAA championship trophies. If you go to the Wooden Center, not Wooden Center, the museum near Wooden Center, you see all these trophies sitting there. You should do that if you haven't. That's the good news. The bad news is that this is a topic of this last part of my talk. Maybe I'll do it in a few minutes. The stroke happens around every one minute and is one of the leading cause of death in the US. So the good news is here. You can see UCLA ranked number one public school. This was in the Bruin. And then uh, this all uh, volleyball team, the ladies volleyball team won one of the last uh, championship trophies for us. And uh, uh, stroke, uh, as you can see, is a leading, uh, a leading uh, cause of death in the US. So what the role we wanted to play? The bad news. The stroke is one of the leading cause of death in the US. The aim of research has been to enable a paradigm shift by electrotextile MRI RF coil with higher comfort level for patients, larger accessibility of imaging area, and higher image quality. The stroke prevention is one application example. So existing uh, coil, when they put people in the MRI machines like that, is very cumbersome, very rigid, and not comfortable for the patient. So we wanted to develop new class of MRI coils to be positioned on the neck to make it comfortable and give you even better images. And the reason for this, this class of a stroke, this is a near the veins near the neck. So the, uh, the, these arteries are the two major arteries near neck. Pieces of plaque can break free. Plaque, I'm sorry, pieces of plaque can uh, break free, travel to the brain and block blood vessels that supply blood to the brain. So we, the goal is to see if these things can be detected or see what the conditions are. So this is the whole thing. This is a little bit uh, convoluted chart. I felt if I don't have time, at least I can show you this. So what we have done, we have a designed a new class of coil that you can put on the neck, very flexible compared to this. And it actually can give even better images because you put it more tighter near the neck and those two arteries. And we actually have developed this whole concept beyond just uh, in our lab. We actually work with some of our medical colleagues at the medical school at UCLA. We even use cadaver tests. So they brought this cadaver and uh, we put our coil around the neck and we took some images through the MRI machine and compared it with more standard ones. So, so and this uh, frequency is 127 megahertz. You can see in my talk, I range from all kinds of frequency, from light all the way to 127 megahertz, even lower frequencies that we work more recently in some other medical applications. So, the, so I don't want to go through details of that. If you have time, I'll do, but for time being, maybe I better come to the end and then see how we can <clears throat> go forward. So, I assume you guys know something about MRI, so I don't want to go through the detail of MRI machines and what MRI is essentially doing and why these coils can capture the electromagnetic waves and then related uh, pictures and all that. So anyway, so we have developed the whole thing. We have developed very unique capability. Again, we did a lot of numerical modeling, Maxwell's equation solutions and all that. And uh, we develop a coil, this representative. We, of course, we never tested human yet because that's not easy. You have to get permissions and all that. But we have done it on some cadavers and we did some uh, human body models inside the MRI machines and all that. And uh, so this shows some of the development procedures. Uh, I'm going a little bit fast here, but in lieu of time, uh, let me just uh, show you uh, we have done all that thing, how to develop these cords. And uh, we, again, you can see these cords have been de designed to have a good match at 127 megahertz, which means that uh, when uh, uh, they radiate or they receive power, they have very good match to the load. So that's the key. 
most of the power either get transmitted or received. That's critical for any antenna works well. We tested them near a fluid which resembles some of the basic characteristics around the neck just to see if our concepts are working and our design are meaningful. And uh, then a lot of tests were done. Um, again, don't want to bother you with the details. The actual frequency, which is the atomic frequency for MRI application, 127.7 megahertz. And some design procedures. Again, we did it both using uh, embroidery concept and also some special uh, uh, material which can be easily integrated with the flexible uh, cloths and things like that. And uh, these are some innovative designs we have. So this is, so again, we did a lot of simulation by putting these designs near the uh, neck of a human that was modeled through a sophisticated compute, computer algorithms. So some evaluation of the models and so forth. So let me go forward. It was tested uh, to see if it breaks or not. So it was many, many cycles of uh, up and down, up and down, up and down, just to make sure they preserve their properties. And then it was deployed. It's not the fanciest neck. It was one of my students. Uh, so he picked this uh, particular coil. Uh, I'm wrapping around the neck. Uh, uh, clotting material and our antenna resides inside. Antenna is are here. Uh, so two of them on two sides of the neck and all that. Uh, essentially, uh, if you want to know what it is, uh, you see these are antennas this side and that side. Uh, so that's what we have. All right. And uh, so then we tested it. Uh, we used the liquid which resembles the body characteristics at this frequency in the MRI machine uh, at UCLA, and then we got some images. So these are the standard coils, that non-flexible bulky coil, and these are all coils, which we believe we got a lot better performance, at least to our best uh, characterization. And the ultimate goal was to use cadaver. So we actually, I went there, but I was outside because you have to put special guns to get in, and they brought the cadaver here, and of course, they cover the face, so we don't know what that, who that person was. But again, medical school does a lot of this for all kinds of application. And we position our coil around the neck of this cadaver and got some images. This is the standard coil when it was positioned, and this is our coil. It was positioned around the neck of the cadaver here. And uh, we believe, again, we got the much better images compared to other ones. The reason is that because our coil comes very close to the neck. It's not rigid. It doesn't stay separate. So it improves the signal to noise ratio to our best understanding. All right. And a concluding observation. So we have all seen that. Okay. I have two more slides and we are done. Again, we have papers published in uh, different journals and so forth and so forth so on, so those are all available if you are interested in. So we are here to help. Hope you all stay healthy and may never need an MRI RF coil system. And if you do, we are here to make you comfortable, <laughs> all right? So remember us. Okay, so what was this talk was all about? I made it in three segments. I gave you an overview of importance of Maxwell's equation, electromagnetic waves, and the vehicle which delivers or receives electromagnetic waves, namely antennas, the paramount components for all these applications, communications, space application, you name it. Then we focus on two uh, bunch of medical related applications in terms of medicine mo monitoring and diagnostics and the brain machine interface and MRI. So somehow I was able to do all these things uh, in this uh, span of time. And uh, so maybe some concluding remarks for you guys. Universities must be considered as vital players in creating new and visionary concepts for future communication systems. This is our antenna lab, a lot of our good students. This is our 
good friend Maxwell, another good friend that I didn't talk about, Darwin, because we use optimization based on Darwin's uh, concept. And then we develop all kinds of antennas. So UCLA Antenna Laboratory, in cooperation with other institutions, is advancing novel antenna design concepts and developments for modern wireless communication applications. So we are looking forward to get you involved if you are interested. So thank you, wishing you safety and happiness. And then since we are at the end of the day, no matter what I talk about, you feel like this. When you're hungry, everything looks like beef. <laughs> so it is 7.30 in Los Angeles. It's a 10.30 East Coast where Cody is. So I know all you guys are pretty hungry, so I better stop. And now, most importantly, it's supposed to be 7.20, but it's uh, 7.30. So, uh, Cody, now you can uh, take the charge here and uh, let me see what you like to do in terms of questions. I'm here, I, I'm around. Uh, yes, we have one question from the chat. So, uh, with regards to the RFID system, mm -hmm. uh, would the with MRI machines, would it interfere with the radio detection? Oh, it's a similar question again. So the, why yeah. didn't you pose the question again? I'm sorry, what was it? It's, um, it's from uh, Julian uh, Camacho. Um, mm -hmm. She asks, uh, would RFID be compatible with MRI machines or would RFID interfere with the radio detection? Uh, RFID, Ooh, maybe I'm missing that. Uh, is that in MRI part? I think it's MRI part. RFID. Uh, the these, I don't know if what these is referring to. Uh, oh, bees? No. <laughs> no, no. what? <laughs> like so bees. Let me go to the chat. Is the question written? Yeah, the question is written, but I, I don't know what exactly he's referring to. All right, so yeah, I think this uh, question of interference is always critical. I appreciate that. And uh, so we always have to be careful to reduce as much as we can the interference. But remember, this particular MRI is functioning at 127.7 megahertz, a very narrow band, because this is the molecular radiation that we are interested in. So, so if there are interference, I'm pretty sure we know what it is and we can either prevent it or make sure it's not in the vicinity of the machine, if that's the question he's asking. Yeah, he was referring to implanted antennas and whether they would be affected by magnets. Oh, 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 yeah, oh, I'm sorry, maybe, so it's not an MRI part then, or is it an MRI part? I mean, of course, anytime you go to do MRI, they ask you, do you have any metal in your body and all that, so in general, it could, but depends what Tesla. So, so this, this machine I was referring to was three Tesla, but there are machines which is lower Tesla, one Tesla, or there are machines which now they're looking at maybe seven or 10 Tesla. So it depends what the magnetic field strengths are, the effect of a metal in your body can be different. That is true, it, it is, of course. It could, it could. That's why whenever you go and do MRI, they ask you, write all the details of what is in your body in terms of metallic pieces. Yeah, okay. Uh, Jerry Ding asks, uh, what projects are you working on currently? Oh, and all of them. It's from space all the way down to MRI, you name it. So, our, our, as, so I would uh, uh, and, uh, encourage you guys, maybe I can go back to my number one here number one, not this one, uh, uh, here. So if you guys go to my, uh, uh, what you, so let me, uh, oh, let me be fancy here. So let me see, can I draw here? Yeah. Oops, it didn't work, just one second. I'm trying to uh, get exciting things here. So yeah, here, <laughs> oh, it worked. All right, so do you see that? You see my screen, right? Yes? You, do you see my screen? Hello? Uh, yes, we, we see your screen. Okay, so I have marked it here. 
So the best place to go, go to my website, www.antlab, ant means antenna, .ee.uc.edu. So you have the list of all publications, projects going on, all kinds of photos, everything. So that would be a good place to look to see what might excite you guys or not. That's the best place to look. Because otherwise, as I said, with some of my students that are working with NASA for space application, some people are working with Mars uh, rover applications, some medical, uh, some theoretical work, numerical electromagnetics, Maxwell equation solvers, some optimization, pretty diverse, very diverse. <laughs> Okay, we'll take one more question and then we will conclude. Okay. If anyone has any more. Uh, hi, Professor. Sorry, um, I, I didn't type the, my question because uh, I'm on my phone. So specifically, I'm interested in a you know, body model where you yes. have uh, basically a, a uh, you said it's a one uh, cubic millimeter uh, like basically one of, yeah one of them because these yeah i'm sorry go ask the question i i then elaborate please go ahead yeah, so sure. I, I just wonder how you really did this because this is really the, the granularity of this body model is uh, you know it's uh, it's 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 really really surprising i mean it's impressive so I just yeah how i think if you the, as time uh, progress the ori the beginning body models were the cubic cell was much bigger. And then actually more recently, Chinese have an amazing body model, uh, even uh, very sophisticated, more detailed and all kinds of, so different parts of the world. It, it was initiated uh, originally, I think someplace, at one of the universities, I believe in Texas, that they create the human body model. But then it got uh, evolved at many other countries. They have their own model because uh, they're using different height, different look, and so forth. So there are actually available many, many interesting models. Even some of the uh, vendors, like if you go to HFSS or CST, and they have their own models. Again, I, I don't recall by heart what resolution they have, but to my best knowledge, uh, uh, they are available very fine. So sometimes if you're interested to put the, let's say, implant antenna in the torso. Uh, electromagnetically, you may not need to model the entire body. The legs may not be as important because the body absorbs. So energy doesn't really go down to the legs, at least at some frequencies, especially high frequency like two gigahertz or one gigahertz, it gets localized. So you only model that part of the body which your antenna is more closely resides on. But at oh, other yeah. frequencies, a very low frequency, then you may need the entire body because then it becomes important. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And uh, I think the relative permitti permittivity is uh, basically a function of uh, water, right? So, because well, human, body, human body is basically 70% water. So. Well, it's part of it. Yes, it's, as a matter of fact, these high numbers like 50, 40, 70, these are all some manifestation of water. But again, you have bone. So bone is not water necessarily. So that's why when they have done these slices, they have identified, I don't know, right now, some of these models may have over 70 tissues or even more, uh, represent more detailed human body. And then those get to be captured. But again, in some application, depending on the frequency, it may not be super critical to have all the tissues modeled necessarily. But it, it, it is available if one needs to use them. That is correct. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's the, um, I mean, it's the uh, uh, dielectric dispersion of water taken into account for the model, because basically around the uh, 18 yeah. gigahertz, like this thing, the capacitance would drop, or rather say the permittivity would drop dramatically. Yeah, in general, the, some of these uh, Maxwell solvers uh, allow you to have a, a, a permittivity or conductivity as a function of frequency. So when mm -hmm. it is function of frequency, inherently, it gives you that capability. But again, depends on the application. If your design has very narrow band, so you focus on that particular frequency, then dispersion is not super critical necessarily. 
but if you are designing in a much broader band or whatever, then you have to give attention if the dispersion plays a role as a function of frequency, for sure, yes. So when we solve Maxwell's equation, we don't bring this divergence of epsilon e, we don't bring epsilon out of the, uh, this uh, divergence, uh, because first of all, epsilon depends on the position, and secondly, in general, can be also a function of frequency. If you solve it in frequency domain, and so forth. That is correct, yes. Thank you, Professor. Oh, you're welcome. All right. Okay, we are all done? Uh, yeah, thank you everyone for coming oh. out. Uh, okay, maybe round of applause for Cody and Natalie. So they work very hard to put this meeting together. So they did a good job. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Have fun and stay safe and happy. That's most important. So we'll talk to you guys later. All right.